Good morning. My name is Zina Wolfington, and I will be moderating today's discussion. On behalf of the Foreign Press Center, I would like to welcome everyone in the room and all those who joined us online for today's briefing. Today, we are honored to welcome Chidi Blyden, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for African Affairs. Ms. Blyden will share the Department of Defense perspective ahead of the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit on Africa's critical leadership role in confronting global peace, security, and government's challenges. A quick review of the ground rules for today's briefing. This briefing is on the record and is being recorded. We will post the video and transcript of this briefing on our website, fbc.state.gov, as soon as it is available. For those of you joining us online, please include your full name and your outlet, as well as the country where most of your readers or viewers are located. And now I would like to invite our distinguished guest to share opening remarks, after which we will open the room for questions. Chidi Blyden. Thank you. I would like to extend my sincere appreciation and thanks to the Foreign Press Center and to all of the foreign and domestic press outlets for allowing me to address you here today in this venue. In a rapidly changing world, we are excited that the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit comes at an extremely consequential time. On the one hand, if you were to take your finger and point to anywhere on the map of Africa, you will easily discover the limitless opportunities that exist on the continent from the ingenuity of the youth population, to the critical minerals necessary to power our future through technologies, to the burgeoning private sector industry that could create opportunities for millions across the globe. I'm a firm believer that the solutions to many of the world's most pressing problems and many of the inventions that will change our lives are found in Africa. There are many African solutions to global issues. On the other hand, the limitless potential is cons consistently threatened by episodes of political instability, challenges to access to basic human needs, access to education, democratic backsliding, physical insecurity, the threat of climate change and environmental degradation, and violent extremism. I would say luckily for humanity, the story of Africa, like other regions of the world, is still being written. I think with the pen in Africa's hands, we must work hard to ensure that stories next chapters are filled are no longer with just the potential hopes and dreams of a great people and a great continent, but that it is filled with the reality that reflects the promises of today and the prosperity that Africa hopes to see. At the African Leader Summit, uh, kicking off next week, the US government and the Department of Defense hopes to communicate our desires, goals, and interests for partnering with in Africa. We hope to use the valuable time to collaborate with many of your leaders. Without their engagement and support, the U.S. finds itself in a difficult position to address mutual security challenges, protect our national security interests, and support African government's objectives to deliver the security dividends necessary to thrive in the 21st century. To establish flourishing democratic institutions and economic opportunities, people need to feel safe and secure and must have confidence in their governments to create environments that are conducive for governance and development. We are not interested in working in Africa without African consultation, collaboration, and coordination. And as such, African voices helping is not a suggestion, but it will actually be a requirement, I think, to shape the world going forward. I think the United States and the Department of Defense also understand that to accomplish these goals and address the challenges of the continent, we must remain fully aware, engaged, and working with our partners. Engagements like the African Leaders Summit will allow us the opportunity to learn from each other, share lessons and best practices, and most importantly, hear from our partners about things that they are interested in and the objectives that they want to achieve. The U.S. has recalibrated its approach. We will not only seek to empower the African continent in the field of security, development, and governance, but we will also strive to help them address the drivers of instability and conflict to meet the ambition and promise of Africa. In this vein, the U.S. will work to employ a whole-of-government approach to empower our African partners to tackle the threat and security challenges that we all face, such as VEOs, political stability, violent conflict, pandemics, food insecurity, democratic backsliding, climate change, environmental degradation, and others. In order for us to work through these issues with our African partners, 
We follow a set of strategic documents that serve as a guiding mechanism for our policies and engagements in Africa. For my work at the Department of Defense, our newly released National Defense Strategy prioritizes three areas of engagement, countering violent extremist organizations, strengthening, this, uh, strengthening and enabling allies and partners to support mutual security objectives, and addressing targeted strategic competition concerns that would have negative ramifications for the U.S. and our partners. In addition to the National Defense Strategy, the U.S. also engages through the Sub-Saharan Framework, also known as the National Security Council's U.S. Strategy for Sub-Saharan Africa. This Africa strategy will refocus the U.S. through four lines of effort. Delivering democratic and security dividends, advancing pandemic recovery and economic opportunities, supporting conservation and climate change adaptations for strengthening a just energy transition, and strengthening our bilateral and multilateral partnerships in Africa. Under these strategies and approaches, DOD will work in a 3D construct, using development, defense, and diplomacy tools to achieve our outcomes. And we will seek to refine our defense tools to support our partners. Some of these tools include supporting institutional capacity building, combating corruption, advancing security sector reform, enhancing our partners' ability to be able to lead and promote peace and security, but most of all, leveraging civilian-led defense institutions and building partner capacity and capability to, to, to deliver security dividends. Our approach has prioritized enabling the development of organic and localized solutions that places African partners in the lead. This carefully calibrated approach leverages the niche capabilities of African countries and that, that we have worked with and have developed over time several capabilities um, that are our strengths to their uh, contributions to African security. As such, we will continue to encourage that you leverage your comparative advantages in the field of security and defense, and we will partner with you to do just this. Further, we will continue to build existing capabilities of African partners on the continent. We have seen over time several partners pulling together in a multilateral fashion to address some of the most stark security challenges on the continent. For example, we have seen the SADC region or the Southern African Development Cooperation Agreement uh, members intervene and <clears throat> excuse me, respond to the crisis in Cabo Delgado in Mozambique. We've seen this also in nearby DRC, where the regional leaders of the East African community are employing their diplomatic and military solutions to bring stability to a conflict, not just using military interventions, but also using dialogue. These African-led solutions are ongoing in both the diplomatic and governance and development realms. We have also just recently seen in Ethiopia, the AU recently broker a temporary peace deal between the Ethiopian government and the TPLF, which has allowed for humanitarian assistance and a pathway towards permanent peace. These, as these solutions are unfolding in real time, the US wants to support these types of African-led efforts as necessary and as determined by our partners. In my building, or where I work, the Department of Defense goal is to improve interoperability among Africans regional, Africa's regional security leaders and to continue the tradition of Africans being first responders to African crisis. <clears throat> the DOD will work across our agency partners um, in a whole of government fashion to allow the private sector to also enter into this approach. We have seen that at every level of global development and supply chains, there is a need for African participation to be a part of the solutions that will bring underlying uh, stability in both the development, defense, and sector, development and defense sectors. The U.S. has developed multiple programs that many of you may be familiar with, such as Power Africa to help grow the energy sector, Digital Initiatives for Africa to help close the gap on technology, and the digital divide and cybersecurity challenges are being addressed through Prosper Africa and the private sector as well. The U.S. will continue to seek to empower African nations to mitigate these threats that we see happening across the continent. Many times I hear from my international partners that they continue to have an expressed intention to partner with Africa and African nations um, and the partners that we partner with. We've seen that multilateralism has provided severe dividends sorry, it has provided dividends very positively when we work together to try and achieve our multiple goals. Our goal is to ensure that African countries do not feel like they have to turn to malign actors to deliver security dividends. As we have seen, many of these actors oftentimes have exacerbated already tenuous situations in the country and are challenged 
uh, with their ability to be able to handle their own security issues. And in that regard, we see partnership and working with as many international partners as being a plus side. And we want to work with African partners to find good partners that they can work with to meet their objectives and goals. Finally, I would say that security exists to enable prosperous societies. This idea is at the center of our approach to the continent. Security forces need to be responsive and accountable to the public. To do this, it is necessary to bring to the table all of society, especially those that are most vulnerable to conflicts. For more than two decades, women, peace, and security programs have empowered women and young girls to have a, a voice in both domestic and international security concerns. We, as a global community, need to ensure that they continue to be included in every discourse. The youth also have a very big role to play in ensuring security. The youth population encompasses a diverse range of stakeholders, such as peacekeepers, on and off the uh, battlefield, and future policymakers in the next generation of young women and boys. We must ensure that they can play an active role in shaping the countries that they are to inherit. As a defense official, it is also crucial to actively build trust between the citizenry and security forces. Community-based dialogues have shown promise by empowering local leaders to work together with each other and the state to ensure security dividends exist in the peripheries and marginalized communities with the help of state security actors. Both entities must interact with one another to foster trust and commitment for strong societies. I think this interaction is exactly why we feel that having the Africa Leaders Summit is a very key moment in time to engage with Africa. The Department of Defense is actively engaged on the continent and will use the African Leaders Summit to seize the opportunity to continue these types of engagements. We look forward to hosting the Peace and Security Governance Forum, where Secretary Austin will work with and speak with his co-host, the Secretary of State and the USAID Administrator uh, to listen to African leaders on lessons learned on security challenges on the continent and where they meet the nexus of development, defense, and diplomacy. Through these various engagements and discussions that will happen during the summit, we will also be listening earnestly and taking the feedback from your governments to continue to refine our approach and our continued engagement in Africa. Our goal is to enable the development of implementable solutions that are centered on what African nations desire and what we believe we as partners can actually provide. For me, security is inextricably linked to the development, creating opportunities, and empowering of African societies. So I look forward to answering many of your questions, and I thank you for your time, and I look forward to welcoming your governments at the Africa Leaders Summit. Thank you for the remarks. We will now open for Q&A. For journalists in the briefing room, please raise your hand if you have a question. If called upon, please wait for the microphone so that everyone online can hear your question and kindly identify yourself with your name and outlet. For journalists joining us online, please raise your hand using the raise hand button and turn on your camera so our briefer can see you. Do we have questions in the room? Thank you. Uh, Carolina Chimoy, Deutsche Welle, Germany's International Broadcaster. Um, what you were just saying sounds very similar to Germany's uh, foreign policy, and they also see this as a key moment to cooperate with um, countries in Africa. Is there also a cooperation between the United States and Germany or the European Union on this? Thank you for the question. I think we have had a, a number of uh, areas where both our European partners and the United States have had... Um, shared or similar objectives in uh, African security. We already work very closely, I think, with um, not just on a bilateral level with Germany, but we also work through the European Union to address uh, a number of uh, security challenges. I think the biggest area where we work together is to complement each other so that we're not doing the same thing. And we've had a number of coordination meetings with our EU partners, our African partners, um, on both the bilateral and the multilateral level to ensure that we are doing and putting our resources uh, towards the actual uh, objectives that we're all trying to achieve. I think the, the change and shift is now we're putting, I think, a bit more emphasis on the African-led uh, uh, opportunities um, that Africans have provided to us, um, and we're working with our, I think, European partners so that they can help coordinate um, with African partners as well. We will go to questions on, do you have a question? Okay. 
Hi, um, I'm Alexandria Williams, also from Deutsche Welle. Um, I have a question about uh, where the Department of Defense stands on uh, Africa's relationship with China in the realm of trade, um, partnerships, and technology. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've worked with our African partners on a number of different um, programs and projects. As I mentioned, we have a lot of the digital initiatives that we're doing from a Department of Defense standpoint. We work with them, our African partners on cybersecurity. Um, and I think where we work with our African partners on those particular areas of telecommunications, um, it does make it challenging for us to work um, with them if they are working with China. We have been told by our African partners, and we completely agree, that they don't want to have to choose between working with the United States, other international partners, and China. Um, and we respect that. I think the biggest part of that is just finding a niche area where we can support our African partners on the things that they're interested in working on um, that doesn't um, conflict with uh, where we can't work with areas um, where China may have um, a relationship with our African partners. I think to your question on the trade piece of it, um, you know, African partners are working with the, the partners that they um, that can provide what they need. Um, and as I said, we respect that and are um, able to work with our African partners on the things that we provide and we need. And those things are different. Um, so I, I, I am open uh, to, you know, understanding more. <clears throat> Excuse me. I forgot my throat this morning. I'm open to understanding more about what our African partners need, and we'll learn a little bit of that from the Africa Leaders Summit, and that's part of the really engagement that we'll be doing is listening and understanding where we can fill in the gaps or where we can work and complement other partners that they're working with to include China. Excuse me. <coughs> I see a couple questions um, online. Um, please, uh, Pearl Matiba, unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, good morning, and thank you so much for uh, taking my question. Um, I just want to begin by just saying um, thank you so much to Abrifa this morning. Um, I'd like to directly ask that you at least do more of these so that our audience could better understand the uh, Department of Defense's motivations and intentions. Uh, remember, we are um, all of your discussions with African leaders will not be complete if you exclude us as journalists. So I think in engaging with us, uh, I really appreciate it. And so that's why I really appreciate you uh, doing this for us this morning. Thank you. So my question is actually a three-part question. It is one question, but a three-part one. Okay. Uh, the first part is, what has changed in DOD's mission? So what is different between your mission under former President uh, Trump's administration <laughs> and now under President Biden's administration, how are these two periods different from your perspective? Uh, of, since, you know, first of all, since the last three years and bearing in mind that uh, this year marks uh, Africa Command's 15th uh, anniversary. <laughs> the second part of my question, I wanna go back to um, the issue about China. Uh, do, do Chinese private military companies exist on the continent? And in what, what ways are they a challenge or a success? And the last part of my question is, on holding you accountable to the American people. To what extent can the American public understand the state of the Department of Defense's planning, programming, accounting, evaluation processes? Do you have a repository that is publicly available to the American people uh, on how many African military personnel have you trained with their hard earned tax dollars uh, over the last, say, seven years, um, and how are you ensuring benefiting countries understanding their responsibilities is there need for any reform? Thank you so much uh, for your responses on these. And I look forward to more engagement with you. This was very good, and thank you for being available. Thank you for the question, and I would love to do more of these, time permitting. Um, I'm looking at my uh, my PA team uh, here with me to, to see if I'm able to do this, but um, I think you're right that the engagement part of and ensuring that uh, media and uh, civil society and journalists are a part of the, the larger process of uh, understanding what the U.S. approach and interests and objectives are on, with working with African nations. I think um, to your first part of the question, what has changed in the DOD mission in the last three years since uh, the changeover in the administration? Um, the first, I would say, is, is engagement. Um, I think there was a, a, a lack of engagement from um, the U.S. writ large 
um, in Africa, um, in some of the areas where we had traditionally seen in other administrations, particularly maybe the Obama administration, um, on, on Africa. For DOD, we kept up our steady engagement through AFRICOM, and that is continuing the work that we were doing to conduct exercises, do partner engagements, and doing the, the work that we do as far as building partner capacity uh, on the continent. You rightfully noted out that AFRICOM is celebrating its 15th year, um, and since that stand-up of AFRICOM, uh, we have seen a little bit of a change in what the U.S. has been focused on. If you remember, AFRICOM was stood up as a 3D construct in 2007. It has always had leadership for as a combatant commander, it has leadership from the Department of State and from USAID, all in its um, leadership structure in Stuttgart. That has meant that whatever challenges have come about over the last 15 years and most recently in the last three years, we've seen a surge in, in one area of security, which I'll, I'll touch on. We have had the, cap the capacity within house in the Department of Defense and with these 3D partners to address those issues. So very early on, we saw you know, governance challenges or maybe we were doing development work. And so we focused on the USAID arm of that, uh, our work that we do through AFRICOM. Later on, we saw there were some challenges with you know, democracy and governance issues. And so we've exercised a little bit more of our State Department um, uh, arm of the DOD AFRICOM. And now I think we're also seeing more of the physical security challenges, the threat from violent extremist organizations, climate change, the effects of pandemics. And so we're focusing how we swing the pendulum uh, to make sure that we are addressing those issues as they're coming about. But the command was designed to do that. I think what is important about how that fits into what you're hearing now about the new approach writ large for the US is that what we have been exercising as a 3D approach to be able to mitigate the threats and interests that are, are challenges that come from the continent, the whole of government now is looking to do and be supportive of. So it's no longer just DOD thinking about it in a 3D way or USAID or Department of Defense. Our commerce colleagues, our trade colleagues, our folks in the private sector are now joining this. So where we're seeing democratic or backsliding happening, um, we know the tools that we have within our US government to be able to address those. And so so I, I know that you, you asked specifically about DOD, but I think from a DOD standpoint, we don't see the military solution being the only and right solution on the African continent. It is a, a, it is a combination of all of these sectors sort of coming together to address the challenges across these uh, multiple nations. To your uh, question about sort of keeping uh, Americans accountable, uh, to uh, what we are doing and where we are training. I'm not sure that we have a, a public record of, of that, but I will tell you that we are extremely active um, through state and local levels of making sure that um, your um, congressional members and your um, uh, interlocutors, I think, on the continent are aware of what we're doing. We do a lot of enabling and partner exercises and engagement to build capacity. Our job is not to train so that we can uh, use you know, African militaries or forces for anything other than um, helping them better secure their nations um, through the kinds of work and things that we, that we do. So we have a, a, a certain amount of money that we put towards these efforts, but this money is dispersed amongst the different organizations and the different departments that do this kind of work. For example, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, who's in the Defense Security Cooperation Agency at the National Defense University, does a number of programs on the continent that deal with parliamentary security sector governance work. They do uh, work on uh, managing security resources. So things that are done at the institutional level alongside what um, maybe AFRICOM is doing at the operational level to help with training and advising and assisting. Uh, so it's. I, it's, I know that's a roundabout uh, maybe answer to your question, but it's not easy to sort of codify the money that is uh, sprinkled amongst the multiple agencies that touch on the different works um, that security uh, encompasses. And then to the, the, your third question on the Chinese PMC companies, I'm not tracking, uh, I'm not monitoring um, Chinese PMC companies on the continent. I'm sure there maybe are some that exist. Um, but we work with our African partners to ensure that they have the right kind of security options, um, whether that be with a number of different international partners, whether they be traditional bilateral partners, or those that they may seek from the private security sector. Um, we are 
you know, challenged, I think, in understanding what other nations are doing um, in African nations. Um, but we try to make sure that the work that we're doing is what we've been asked to do um, and complements other efforts that our partners are doing. Next question goes to Simon Atiba from Today African News. You're muted, we don't hear you. Thank you, thank you Chidi for doing this. That was a beautiful long speech at the beginning, but thank you and thank you for the National Press, the Foreign Press Center for taking my question. This is Simon Ateba with Today News Africa in Washington. My question is also on China mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to maritime. I don't know if you can be a bit more specific I know that the U.S. Uh, has raised concern about some of the ports uh, and some of the things, the infrastructure that they are building around the Gulf of Guinea. And also when it comes to countering false narrative, narratives against the U.S., uh, is the U.S. doing enough? Do you guys have a program at the defense at the Department of Defense to counter all those false narratives. I know that when it comes to communication, for instance, um, I don't think you are doing enough demonstrated by the way you are treating today News Africa and myself uh, not having our back. So if you can address those two issues, that'd be great. Thank you. No, thank you for the questions. Um, I, I think I got the, the second part and it uh, was on what the U.S. is doing to counter false narratives in the misinformation space? Yes. Okay. Um, to your question on China's uh, uh, involvement in the maritime domain, we remain concerned about the illegal fishing um, that is happening in the Gulf of Guinea, as you noted. Um, uh, this seems to be an area where China has uh, a lot of interest um, and is uh, making inroads into... Um, not just maritime waters, but as you, I think, described um, uh, infrastructure uh, on the, the continent. Um, you know, as we've noted, we've worked with our African partners so that they understand the risks and challenges of uh, partners who are uh, doing work in their areas or in their countries um, that may not have the, the best output for them. Um, and we are in communication with our partners in Africa so that they know the, the ramifications of the, the partnerships uh, that they are, are entering into. Um, we, we wouldn't be a good partner if we didn't share that information. I think our, our challenge is um, that we're not interested in uh, trying to uh, counter partnerships that uh, African partners desire. We want to make sure that we are the partner that they want to work with and we're providing the things that they actually need and that they want to create the types of governments and societies that they think are, are prosperous for them. And so our engagement has been to increasing, uh, increase training and awareness and knowledge on uh, maritime safety and security. We work with them on um, exercises in the Gulf of Guinea and other parts of the, the continent in the maritime domain uh, so that they understand uh, how to counter piracy, how to counter illicit trafficking and uh, transnational threats that might come across the waters. Um, and so we've increased our engagement with African partners and militaries and navies to understand the, the multiple steps of um, not just interdicting some of these transnational threats, but also um, the prosecution process that happens over um, um, after there have been um, apprehension of, of illegal fishing and, and other sort of, sort of illicit activities that are happening. Um, so that's where our focal point is, I think, in the, the Gulf of Guinea and when it comes to maritime. Um, and we think that's our strongest suit or our strongest way to be able to enable African partners uh, to work on the, the things that are most important to them, and that is protecting their blue economies um, so that those feed back into their, their government economic structures. On the false narratives piece, this is a challenge. Um, we have a, a long-standing history of uh, working with our African partners, being very close to them at, at diplomatic levels, 
Um, but I think you, as you noted, you know, the social media space and misinformation avenues and outlets that are out there um, are able to reach a wider audience um, than what we might always uh, engage with from a diplomatic level. And so I, I think it is a, a goal of ours and an objective of ours to be able to help um, not just media outlets, but I think the uh, civil society groups and the average um, African citizen understand uh, what information is truly um, uh, correct or truthful um, and as it is becoming a, a large tool um, to, I think, uh, destabilize um, some societies. We are working, I think, not necessarily at the Department of Defense um, to counter misinformation, um, but across the U.S. government to ensure that we are putting forth uh, truthful information. We are working with partners so that they can understand and sift through uh, what else is being uh, put out from um, other outlets that may not have... Um, not be able to be verified, um, but this is a, a concerted effort of the U.S. government to ensure that African partners can feel comfortable um, with the information that they receive. Um, and there are a number of programs that we're doing, as I said, across the U.S. government to do this. Mesfin Bazou from Ethiopia. Ms. Finbizu, do you have a question? Please unmute yourself. We'll go to Peter Fabricius from South Africa for now. Okay, thanks very much for the briefing. Uh, Peter Fabricius from the Daily Maverick in South Africa. I wanted to ask you about the situation in West Africa. We've seen a, a massive retreat of France and um, other European powers from the the region because of um, hostility from the local population, uh, probably very much um, provoked by the, the the military juntas in several cases, uh, and and creating, I think, an unconducive environment for any kind of foreign military assistance and fighting extremism. How how is the U.S. Um, dealing with that? I mean, the U.S. is staying the course. Is it? Is it? changing its locations, is it changing its partnerships? Um, what is its its strategy for dealing with the a new kind of um, of threat to if it's by foreign powers to, to help African countries deal with violent extremism? Thank you. Thank you for, for the question. Um, the U.S. remains committed to working with our African partners to address um, the challenges in West Africa as well as in the Sahel. I think we are continuing to move forward with our 3D approach. We believe that this is probably the, the, the best way to address the challenges as we've seen it shift a little bit from just a violent extremist organization challenge to, as you rightfully noted, some democratic backsliding with having some uh, political instability, um, as well as some of the development challenges. And so rather than trying to address this purely from a military standpoint, which I think has been um, what has challenged uh, many of our partners who have put resources in this, um, in this region, is that we have to try and address all of these things at the same time. Um, and so we're trying to learn from past efforts in the Sahel and, and ensure that we have um, engagement and partnership and collaboration with our African partners to do this. Um, we also know that there is an effort to try and address the root causes. Um, and we believe we can work with our partners to uh, prevent the spread of violent extremist organizations uh, root in some of these countries if we can get at some of those root causes. And so I think you'll see uh, an effort from the U.S. government to uh, promote programs um, and work with international partners to do more to try and address whole of government, whole of society approaches um, to mitigate some of the, the threats that we're seeing, not just from violent extremist organizations, but from political instability as well. Next question, Yusuf Ba, Al Jazeera, Qatar. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much um, for the briefing today. Uh, my question is um, about um, the U.S. assistance in training um, 
African um, military. Um, don't you think some of the, the the impact of some of this training that the U.S. government is giving to Africa is responsible to some of these coup d'etats in Africa? For example, in my country, um, when the U.S. military we are training Guinean military when they overthrow President Alpha Conde, mm -hmm. and during the day of the coup, um, a group of U.S. military we are female coming out from the military barracks um, where they were training the U.S. Uh, the Guinean military to the U.S. embassy. So, don't you think some of these assistance um, you are giving directly to train these people is responsible for some of these coup d'etats in Africa that was leading the effect of? some of these, uh, some of the people suffering in Africa? Well, the Department of Defense engages with our partners um, by providing programming and training that supports democracy and governance alongside um, maybe what you would see as far as traditional um, military training, um, which would uh, enhance their skills um, to be able to go after certain uh, security threats that we, that we work with our partners to do. But the training that we do includes uh, you know, uh, as I said, democracy, governance, uh, civilian control, and professionalization of the military. I think the reality is, is that our, many of our African partners receive training from our governments, um, but they also receive training from other governments. Um, and it is our hope that our African partners will internalize the lessons and the values that we emphasize, um, you know, democratic control of the military and civilian control and professionalization. Um, but we are, are one part of, I think, the, the security architecture that African partners um, in, desired to have. DOD always seeks to ensure our cooperation has human rights components. And I think we have stressed uh, to our partners whenever we do training that you know, good governance and democracy um, is the foundation um, for strong security, not necessarily the military forces. And so we will continue to Program, you know, continue to do programming and training with African militaries, emphasizing all of these points as a part of our training, as, we, as we've consistently done. Um, and as I said, we are always um, hopeful that they will internalize our training over others, um, but we, we are realistic that there are a number of different um, uh, influences um, that come to African militaries, depending on the, the security uh, training and needs that they, they desire. Next question, Ahmad Kane, Les Echos. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so my question is, um, uh, is about the, the request of the African uh, countries to get a seat, a permanent seat on the uh, Security Council. UN Security Council. So this uh, this summit will be uh, an opportunity to is it is it an opportunity for the U.S. to talk with the African leaders on this issue? Absolutely. I think uh, the United States has come out very strongly um, at the last UN General Assembly in September and announced that we are committed to ensuring that uh, Africa not just has seat. Uh, but seats on the Security Council, recognizing their importance um, in uh, global politics and, and global security challenges and issues. So I don't doubt that that won't be a, a focal point of conversations that happen between African heads of state, um, as well as with uh, the U.S. government uh, senior officials who will participate in the Africa Leaders Summit. Thank you. Next question, Sho Bapu from NHA, NHK Japan. Uh, yes, hi, do you hear me? Um, I'm Sho Bapu, uh, a Japanese journalist and the bureau chief of NHK Japan's public broadcaster. Um, I'm currently in Windhoek in Namibia, so I'm sorry if the lines are weak. Um, what can you tell us about how you see Wagner's activities in Africa, please? Thank you for the question. Um, the U.S. remains very concerned about Wagner's presence in the region. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Show, would you please mute yourself? Perfect, thanks. 
No, thanks for the question. I was just uh, saying that the U.S. remains very concerned about Wagner's presence in the region. The Wagner group continues to commit violence and uh, against civilians um, alongside the, the work that they're doing. And we remain deeply concerned about their activities, not just in Mali, but also in Car, Libya, and elsewhere in, in Africa. Uh, we've seen them operate in uh, a way that does not always protect the, the rights of uh, civilians on the ground. Um, and in the places that we've seen Wagner operate in the past, uh, human rights abuses tend to exacerbate already challenging situations and suffering of, of people um, while eroding the security um, of the of the forces that they are typically working war, for or with and, and the country that they're working with. Um, I think we are, have strongly advised in the past countries in Africa not to work with Wagner, uh, realizing that Africans have a, a choice of, of security actors and that they want to work with and partner with. Um, but I think we have made it our priority to try and work with African partners who um, have a desire to increase their capabilities or their capacity to address security challenges in their countries with other options and with uh, other alternatives. Um, and so while we are not um, uh, present on uh, the African continent um, to put U.S. Uh, boots on the ground, we are interested in making sure that African partners have the capacity to be able to do what they can do um, with um, the, the resources that they have as if they pull their resources together and work together. So it's, 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 it's challenging to um, uh, comment on a, another security forces um, impact um, but what we've seen thus far is, and with Wagner's presence on the continent, it has, not been, it has not been positive for African partners in the long run. We have time for one last question. I see a question in the chat from Christine Madison. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question, Christine? Uh, yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Please uh, name your outlet and country. Uh, Okay, um, I'm working for Financial Africa in Senegal. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. What is your question? Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. But I was wondering about the treaties that you brilliantly uh, describe. Um, my remark is that uh, the US is still the biggest seller of weapons in, in the world. And I was wondering about uh, an, an eventual change of policy towards uh, selling weapons to the African continent. Um, is it going to be any announcement being made during the summit? And how are you going to help African countries to uh, better afford their security issues, which in West and Central Africa are bigger and bigger? Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. So I think you uh, um uh, rightfully um, uh, curious about our uh, announcements that we will make at the Africa Leaders Summit, and unfortunately, I can't get ahead of you know what uh, will be announced at the summit because we'll we'll leave that to the the principals who will have the pleasure of doing that. Um, but I think we will uh, talk a little bit more about how we will be uh, employing this 3D approach and what that will actually look like. So to the approach that we've laid out with it being defense, diplomacy, and development. Uh, we intend to increase not just engagement um, and in those areas, but I think um, the way that we will try to engage partners will be a lot more uh, focused on African-led opportunities. And so to your, your question about how we will enable African partners to um, do more to address the security situations on the continent, our focus um, with our 3D approach is to, to really lean in to African institutions, African-led opportunities, African-led um, initiatives uh, to try and address um, some of the challenges. We've seen a lot of work come from uh, the regional economic communities and the African Union. Uh, we have examples of obviously of Somalia, uh, where the African Union and regional forces have been uh, a strength in uh, making sure that that situation has been um, uh, uh, stabilized as much as possible, but we want to do more of this type of engagement where we really lean into African-led opportunities. And so that is where um, the 3D approach will really um, help us uh, figure out how we work with African partners to address their security concerns. I think 
uh, that's what maybe what we have time for, uh, but maybe just quickly touching on your, your point on the, the weapon sales. Um, the U.S. weapon sales um, that we do in Africa are uh, minimal in comparison to uh, what we actually um, uh, do, I think, elsewhere in the in the world, and I think African partners have chosen a variety of partners to um, get their um, weapons or defense material from. Um, but we also are very heavily engaged in working with African partners on ensuring that they have the technology uh, to be able to strengthen their ministries of defense. Um, as well as have operability um, for their uh, soldiers and their militaries to be able to perform in peacekeeping operations, whether that's um, using uh, different types of uh, defense material that the U.S. provides from cars and trucks to um, equipment and gear. Um, and so we will continue to, I think, provide as much as African partners need to, to get the after the security challenges that they face. Um, but it is a part of um, our training and that they are um, engaged in the U.S. private sector uh, to work on some of these issues. This ends the Q&A session. I would like to express our special thanks to G.D. Blyden and all FBC journalists who participated. This concludes today's briefing. Thank you.